COBRA is a pro bono initiative co-founded by Schindler's Attorneys, IQ Business, and Engaged Business Turnaround, offering free legal accounting, consulting, um, and turnaround advice to businesses in financial distress. Well, this afternoon, as always, with every two weeks, we have Singular that join us. Um, and today, they have a, a special guest, Mamecha Moshe from Moshe Capital. She'll be joining us together with Lorenzo, and she'll be talking mergers and acquisitions, options post-COVID. So this is going to be a very interesting discussion um, here, only here on COBRA. So if I could uh, just quickly go through the bios of, uh, of our two guests. Um, Mamete has a wonderful uh, CV. She's the founder and CEO of Moshe Capital, a South African advisory and investment firm specializing in corporate finance, management consulting, and investment across various sectors in Africa. Ms. Moshe has over 17 years experience in corporate finance, equities, uh, finance, equities capital markets, debt capital markets, black economic empowerment, accounting, auditing, and corporate tax. She's worked at Morgan Stanley, UBS, and KPMG. She has advised on transactions of well over 10 billion US dollars across the African continent, mainly in the mining, telecommunications, agriculture, manufacturing and consumer products and services. Mamete is a qualified chartered accountant and holds an MBA in the Global Executive Program at Columbia Business School and London Business School. And a BCom Honours in Accounting and a BCom Honours in Management Accounting from the University of Poisoned and Natal. Um, just a bit more on Moshe Capital. It's a South African black woman owned and run advisory and investment firm with a presence in Johannesburg and London. Welcome Mamete, great to have you. Uh, as always, Lorenzo is a bit of an in-house guest of ours from um, Singular, an, ad an advisory um, that had uh, their offices here in Johannesburg. He's head of African uh, um, operations. Great to have you, Lorenzo. I'm going to hand over to you first. Excellent. Thanks, Gary, and welcome, uh, Mamecha. Good to, good to have you here. So, so welcome everybody and thanks for for joining us as usual so i'll quickly go through the a uh, couple of words on the 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 objectives of uh, singular uh, compass uh, just to remind uh, uh, the ones of you that have uh, joined previously or the ones of you that have not joined previously and that joined for the first time so we since the beginning of the lockdown we've tried to we, we, we've soon realized as everybody else of the gravity of the situation. And we've also realized that most decision makers were really overloaded with a massive amount of information, some of which was more, let's say, trying to make headlines rather than uh, necessarily inform people. So we said, let's, let's use our competence base and try and lend a, lend a hand to decision makers in the country. And that's how Singular Compass really came about. And in particular, our objective is, 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 is fourfold, is to provide a level-headed source of input that can become the sort of one-stop shop, one uh, uh, and only, uh, let's say, uh, uh, or main input of information for decision-making for CEOs and, and, and senior decision makers in the country. Be practical as much as possible. So we know the situation is negative. We know uh, there is a crisis out there, but let's focus, let's, let's qualify that and focus on what we can do about it, as well as assessing, uh, let's say, the situation on a, on a weekly by weekly basis. And then let's be transparent about the many known unknowns that we have uh, out there. There's a lot of variables we don't know, especially related to the virus, but also related to the, the ability of the economic system uh, to react uh, to this kind of shock, which is unprecedented. And finally, we try to provide and contribute learnings from our own uh, expertise as, uh, as a management consulting house and, and as investors, uh, drawing from the last uh, few crises and drawing from the, 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 our, our clients and, and corporate clients and investors that we help globally uh, face uh, past crises, different other crises and this, and this same crisis. Okay. So the structure of the document is as the usual. So you're probably used to this uh, to the setup by now. We quickly will go through an update on the virus and healthcare situation because obviously this is what cascades into everything else. So how is the situation now? 
and how could it unfold in South Africa based on what we know now, the best possible information from today. Secondly, how is the economy reacting to, to what's happening and how is the economy reacting to the policy uh, that is being put in place locally and globally and vice versa, how the two are really interacting with each other. So what will happen from an economic, uh, from an economic standpoint? And then thirdly, how can business react and how is business reacting? That's the third chapter and typically we make it thematic. This the theme of today and that's why Mamecha is, uh, is uh, our uh, very welcome guest uh, today. It's very much uh, M&A uh, acquisitions and, and, and private equity buyouts, which are sectors that from different perspectives, both Mamecha and I, both Singular and Moshe Capital uh, uh, address. Now, first slide is the usual uh, we attempt to summarize the situation. What you see on the y-axis is very much the number of, well, the logarithmic number of, of death per, per million. And on the, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, you have the deaths, uh, uh, um, the total confirmed, uh, confirmed death. So what you see in terms of the inclination lines is the speed at which the fatalities are unfortunately doubling. Now, the speed initially in South Africa was very low, which was very positive, and we always uh, uh, highlighted it as such. Unfortunately, recently in the last, I would say, four to six weeks, the speed has been increasing, which is obviously a bad news. The good news is that if you look at the order of magnitude in relation to other countries, we are still very far away from, uh, or we are still quite far away from the levels of death per million people uh, uh, that, that we've seen, especially in Europe and in the United States, and of recent also in places in the Southern Hemisphere like Mexico and Brazil. Now, let's look at the, let's try to also get a sense of where are we at in the curve. So you see on the top part of the slide, you see three countries that have seen more or less, sorry, Nalini, if you don't mind going to the next uh, slide. So you see the top part of the, of the slide really highlights three countries that have broadly been over the first wave, hopefully the, the only wave. And we've seen that, that more or less from the beginning to the end, uh, this has lasted roughly three months. Uh, now on the bottom part of the slide, you obviously see a different case, uh, which is the, the, the United States in which it actually started three months ago, but it's still rather uh, on, the, on, the, on the high side. So we haven't seen this, this, this flattening and then changing direction of the curve quite yet. If we look at South Africa and Mexico, we are very much midway through the curve. So if South Africa wants to, as we all hope, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and, and it, to, to a big extent, it will be clear in the next two to three weeks uh, that, that South Africa is heading towards the Spain, Italy and UK way, this could mean that we are sort of halfway uh, through the curve uh, slash one month left before things are, are starting to, 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 to flatten and then decline. Okay. Let's move on to the next page. The other good news, which, which the other good news comes from science. And uh, many of you have probably read uh, the news over the past couple of weeks. There is one specific uh, drug called dexamethasone. I always struggle to pronounce it, uh, but that's, uh, let's say the, the good news is that already uh, uh, trials have been done and have highlighted with a, with a decent degree of, of confidence that actually quite a lot of lives can be saved by the, by, because we are basically preventing, uh, 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 let's say, bad side effects from, from happening. Roughly one out of eight uh, patients on ventil ventilator could be could be spared. Their life could be spared if, if this drug was used. And one out of 25 of the patients on oxygen. Now the other good news, but for this it will take more time, is that we have already in phase three, uh, 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 actually three possible vaccines of different types and coming from different countries. And this this gives us a lot of hope. Uh, but at the same time, let's not be naive because it will still take some time and uh, even the commercialization phase, especially the early commercialization phase of a vaccine can take quite a lot of time. And that typically is also where the hurdles and uh, the possible, uh, some of the possible side effects that have been undetected uh, appear. So I would say overall good news, but let's, great news, but let's not uh, uh, be ahead of ourselves. 
another important finding, I mean, we all said weeks ago we were fearing, especially for HIV positive and, and TB uh, patients uh, uh, in South Africa due to the high percentage uh, of, uh, of, such, uh, of, such, uh, of such cases. Uh, it, it turns out that if you look at it in order of magnitude, uh, diabetes in first instance and in second instance hypertension are actually much more dangerous uh, at least uh, at least for what we've seen so far which seems to be a relatively good good sample because the numbers unfortunately uh, for now are or to now are, are high it's, they seem to be much higher risk factors than uh, than HIV and and, and and TB so important that we treat and we and we we, we treat with maximum care especially people uh, that have uh, that have these uh, these kinds of complication and we we have them social distancing as much as we possibly can. There's a big new addition to our document, which by the way, I need to not forget to mention that we publish uh, every week after we the webinar uh, uh, on LinkedIn. So you can feel free to, uh, to link up with my profile or Singular's profile and you'll receive the full, uh, the full report if you're not on our mailing list. But the big new addition to this, uh, 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 this week uh, edition is very much a, a, a model that we've basically we are co-authoring with NMG. Uh, it's actually an NMG model that we've sort of worked on uh, uh, together uh, uh, after their, their posting. And we, we, we came to even more, let's say, uh, 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 hopefully uh, accurate uh, predictions and analysis on the way the slope of the curve uh, could go. According to our assumptions, and as you know, we always have a best case, a base case, and a worst case, you can feel free to, to, to obviously have a look at those assumptions in detail on, on, on the re report. But it seems like, obviously, needless to say, we are in a worse position uh, in terms of the shape of the curve vis-a-vis -vis where we were three weeks ago and we had the last webinar. So we have to increase uh, especially after the, 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 the even more accurate uh, modeling revisits the estimate of fatalities by the end of August, we think to nine to anywhere between nine and 23,000 people by the end of August. Okay. Um, this slide basically shows us uh, uh, and allows us to, to also have a look and estimate based on the estimates of reported infection, unreported infection, number of deaths and hospital admissions, it especially helps us assess when and if we will run into bad critical care, bad capacity constraints. Now, according to our, our models, again, the same models done with, uh, with NMG, uh, we will need actually a substantially higher capacity than, than what we have of critical care bed certainly in the worst case uh, scenario, and we will be slightly constrained to medium constraint in the base case and in the, in the best case. So important, if there's anything we can do to speed up the building of or the increasing of capacity at the bottlenecks, whether that is bed or, or, or doctors, I think this and the last few weeks really are the time to, 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 act, uh, to act there. Now let's move into the political and sort of the, the policy and economic implication to this crisis. There's one big thesis that we have at Singular, which is that this crisis is going to be just like the last crisis, but probably even more for the reasons that I will be saying in the next slide, but this crisis will be a crisis more of small businesses than a crisis but than, than one of, for, for large businesses, and it will affect small countries more then it will affect large countries. We've seen exactly the same phenomenon happening in, in after the 2008 crisis. And unfortunately, we believe this would be even magnified uh, in this crisis, which obviously the call for action here is to policymaker and to, to, to all of us to find ways to rebalance the situation. Because if you think about, just take for as an example, in 2008, 2009, the net job loss of companies from one to 250 employees in the US has been explaining roughly 60, 60 plus percent 
of the job losses vis-a-vis -vis a 44 percent of the total employment base in that particular bracket so you see there's a big disproportion in the extent to which uh, small businesses and medium businesses have been affected and South Africa represent in South Africa small and medium businesses represent roughly 50 percent of South African employment so you can see how essential it is that we direct uh, uh, policy measures and, and help to, to small and new businesses. If we move to the next slide here, we see my first argument, which was the, or my second argument, which was the one that small countries will be hit worst. I mean, unfortunately, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, Big economies have big, bigger spending power and typically have also lower, not always, but have also higher capacity. Either they have because they have lower indebtedness or just more a higher level of, of confidence uh, on, their, on their balance sheet in the market and therefore they can, they can, uh, they can, uh, they, they can increase the amount of, of debt. So the combination of these two things make it such that countries like Germany uh, <clears throat> can their, their, their stimulus package can be up to as much as 33% of their GDP, uh, which is what we record uh, uh, today, vis-a-vis 3.5% -vis after the 2008 financial crisis. And then you see how this compares, and obviously second you have Japan and France, UK and US, so massive numbers in comparison to GDP. And um, especially if you compare that to smaller countries like South Africa, whereby even though in percentage of GDP, it's still a relatively big amount. I mean, we're talking about 8.6% of the GDP uh, in terms of uh, stimulus. So we're really talking about stimulus on, on steroids, as you read on the, on the news. <clears throat> that still doesn't quite compare to the amount of capital that can be deployed by bigger countries, and certainly doesn't compare to the amount. But fortunately, on the other hand, it compares very favorably to the amount and the extent of the response after 2008. If you look at business confidence, which typically is an excellent indicator for the demand effect uh, uh, in terms of what can we expect from business behavior, consumer behavior, uh, business confidence is in South Africa at its lowest point and it's actually 14% below where it was in the dip of the financial crisis. And of course, we all know that uh, we have the highest uh, unemployment rates right now in South Africa in a, in, in, in a decade and, and, and probably even much more. The good news is that, I mean, on the one end, this has been a massively deep, let's say, fall, not only for South Africa, but globally, because of the various lockdowns and supply shocks. But on the other hand, the good news is that the recovery also seems to be faster than expected. And if you look at the Chinese figures and even the unemployment, I'm talking about export figures right now. So the rebound of exports and the, the figures on, so how unemployment figures are basically changing direction and starting to, 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 to diminish in the US. These two indicators are, we believe, great news in terms of the speed at which uh, uh, the recovery is already happening. Obviously, it's happening starting from a very bad point because the dip was so, so deep. Um, but that's, that's, that's good news uh, and, and a good, uh, let's say, uh, ray of light uh, out there. Now, let's move into the topical. So let's, let's, let's jump into business. And in particular, in this, as I said, in this, uh, this webinar, we wanted to very much discuss m and 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 private equity uh, buyouts. Uh, Mamesha will talk a little bit more about the M&A environment. I wanted to make some points on the private equity space, which is very close to close to my heart and our and our business. Um, so obviously, global buyout transaction fell. I mean, understandably by uh, by a large amount, in particular, sixty percent from from January to April uh, this year, which is which is understandable. Uh, we've seen this also in the last in the last uh, last crisis. The difference is that, or well, not the difference, but let's say we certainly have in this particular situation an unprecedented amount of dry powder waiting to be spent. So funds globally have been raising 
a lot of capital. We are talking about $2.6 trillion, uh, 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 which is two times what, what, was, uh, what was the amount in, uh, what the amount was in 2013. Um, and this money will be deployed, which is, uh, <clears throat> I would argue, a good news both for the private equity houses, but also for the, for the economy, because that money will be, will be plunged into, into the economy. One thing to note, and this is more of a point, point of view that a private equity house should consider, is the fact that if you look at the IRR, so basically the returns, the compounded returns of yields that were done in 2008 and 2009, or let's say in 2009 rather, so after the dip, <clears throat> those deals, that vintage year, uh, um, explain an average difference of almost 20 percentage point in IRR. So that's to say that funds that manage to time their acquisition strategy in a way that they would buy, they, do, they would do value acquisitions at the, at the bottom of the market, they actually increased the IRR, the average IRRs in their, in their, uh, for those deals vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the fund by as much as 20% on top, which is actually not 20%, 20 percentage point of IRR. Uh, which is which is gigantic. <clears throat> Somebody saying Can you hear me? Can somebody hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, no, sorry, apologies, but there was a uh, a message from somebody saying that they couldn't hear. Okay. It was a small moment where it was choppy, but it's back. Okay, super. Um, now, what, what can private equity firms, what have we seen, let's say, the, the most successful uh, uh, private equity houses uh, doing in the, prior cri in the previous crisis, but also in the current crisis for the early signs that we start to see is, I mean, what's critical here is obviously allocation of time. So how can you focus your time in the most effective way, in a way that you focus your time on the portfolio companies that have relevance for you and where you have a high ability to win, so an ability to impact, to help them, basically, without taking too much bandwidth away from the origination, screening, and due diligence uh, uh, part of your activity, which is what will determine if you catch the, uh, the type of returns that we've seen or extra returns that we've seen in the, in the previous space. And if you look at, I mean, usually uh, uh, what we see is that the private equities tend to focus 80% of their value announcement team uh, 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 focus on no more than 20, 30% of their portfolio. And in particular, they prioritize vis-a-vis -vis what's of high relevance for them. That obviously is very simple indicators like the share of the fund uh, that that particular portfolio company uh, represents. and whether there is a, a, a short-term, short-term, mid-term mid -term prospect for exit, so whether we are close to an exit, in which case we need to address it quickly or more quickly, and then the ability to win, which is the horizontal axis, uh, which, which basically looks at, I mean, two things. One is the, the level of the threat, <clears throat> and the other one is the internal ability to, to intervene. Level of the threat is we need to take a view uh, on the long-term demand effects on the portfolio company. So is there something that we can fix there because it's just temporary or are consumer behavior changing for good in that particular, particular segment? And then what is the extent of the threat to the balance sheet? Can we fix it? Is it, you know, can the company digest uh, a few months of uh, 30, 40, 50% lower, lower revenues? And I mean, most of the <clears throat> private equities I work with Many of them talk about uh, an average revenue decrease in their portfolio forecast for 2020 of easily 30 to 40 percent revenue decrease. Um, so that's that's obviously not not trivial, and hence the need to to really prioritize where can you make a difference, where can you fix it, where can you can you focus your your energy, and then the other part is is obviously what can you do to fix it because. It, it's, it's, it's all good and great to say that you want to intervene in your portfolio, but do you have the right competences to solve that particular problem? If it's about recapitalizing or bridge financing, then it's you know, obviously whether you have 
within your mandate still the ability to do so. But if it's about to operationally intervene, then you need to ask yourself the questions of whether, whether you really truly have a team that is, uh, that is an internal value announcement team that is competent to be able uh, to help uh, uh, in that area. If not, rather not, uh, uh, let's say, complicate things and let management team uh, do uh, as they can. <clears throat> okay. So what opportunities do we see out there specifically in South Africa? I mean, this is to some extent true globally, certainly also specifically in South Africa. I mean, there's three broad themes that, I mean, beyond the healthcare topic, which we think in many sub-segments is more of a, let's say, short to midterm opportunity. So not necessarily <clears throat> differential vis-a-vis -vis what, what was there uh, before, if you look at it with a five to 10 year horizon, but there's really three broad teams. I mean, one is the Falling Angels, which is basically companies with low growth prospects, but that you can acquire at very high value for money because they're, and obviously that happens only when the sellers, so when the assets get repriced and the sellers are actually uh, uh, pushed to, to sell. What we see in the market that already uh, I mean, you've probably read on the news about Sun International. You've probably read on the news about 91 in partnership uh, with, with Ethos uh, launching a new uh, 10, 10 billion rand fund to, 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 to target businesses that are in distress. You probably have read the news about uh, a lot of the, the property funds that are in trouble and, and therefore investments are gathering uh, in some shape or form to, 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 to acquire them, buy them out. Uh, and rescue them. So there's a few themes within this macro team, but that's very much the number one. The number two is what we call the Green New World. Now, what this means is nothing materially different from what existed the day before COVID. <clears throat> it's just that the speed, uh, we'll see the speed at which, let's call this, this Green New World theme will, will continue is just increased. So we'll see a change in speed uh, at which uh, uh, things like, and if you look at South Africa, I mean, renewables. Is there now a time to, 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 to really shift the gear when it comes to renewable? It seems, it seems like this is the case if you look at what African Rainbow Capital Investments has done, if you look at the, 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 the new, uh, let's say, uh, uh, IPP discussions, and a lot of the, the acquisitions that are either in the making or in the thinking uh, uh, in that space. Renewables are obviously not the only one. A lot of ESG driven or related investments are absolutely within this team and, uh, uh, and, and therefore fall within the, if you think about the mining sector, how does the mining sector react to a theme like this? Typically by investing into the new battery metals, the new, the new minerals, uh, uh, so that they can play within this new team. So this new team doesn't mean just renewable. You can look at it across sectors, across the value chain. And then the third one is the digital runners. This one is the very easy one to, to, to imagine because this is another big trend, big theme that was existent before COVID, but it's just changing speed. If you look at the rate at which the, the, the digital penetration has increased in countries like Italy, but also South Africa, it has done the increase in penetration uh, that it would have done in, f in three months, that it would have done in five years pre-COVID. So this is, this is here to stay. And the speed will maybe slow down a little bit, but the increase in speed vis-a-vis -vis before is absolutely guaranteed. Yeah? And, and needless to say, this, I mean, everybody thinks FinTech, thinks health tech, and so on and so forth, but there's also a lot of play in the infrastructure uh, uh, space behind the digitization uh, uh, of uh, of businesses of 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 especially of businesses yeah so there's a lot of sub teams uh, within this that I think will become are becoming and and are already extremely the government itself and just unveiled a plan to galvanize to basically put in another two point three trillion rand into new infrastructure investments including digital infrastructure. So this is something that will not only be driven by private sector, but also incentivized, hopefully, by uh, and pushed by, by government. So creating the momentum there. 
Excellent. So said that, I'm very happy and, uh, and glad to pass on the words to uh, 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 my friend uh, uh, Mamecha and uh, I'll leave you in good hands and then uh, she'll, uh, she'll let us, uh, she'll walk us through her perspective and uh, Moshe Capital's perspective on the South African m a space and what's happening in the market from where, where, where she stands. Thank you, Lorenzo, um, for the invitation. And thanks to Singular, our partners, as well as uh, Gary and Cobra for the invitation. Um, you know, I missed COVID-19 pandemic and um, the distress as we are all facing um, a GDP contraction of seven to 10%. I hope that in the next 10 minutes or so, I can bring a little bit of light or when we look at what has happened and what are the opportunities that we see. Um, on the first slide here, um, we just wanted to talk about what have we seen since uh, COVID started before we actually go into what the opportunities are. On the left side, um, we look at the stock markets. What have the stock markets done? So since um, the World Health Organization declared um, the COVID pandemic um, on 30 January 2020, um, the JSE All Share has um, gone down by 4%, which is in line with the S&P 500. So, you know, the, 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 if, when you look at the impact from the stock markets, it has really recovered um, uh, uh, from where we were when, we, when this announcement was made. And then secondly, um, the mining and industrial sectors seem to have uh, recovered back to performance uh, prior to COVID, uh, the start of the pandemic. And obviously there was the initial shock uh, that came in when lockdown was announced where the stock markets crashed, but we seem to be back online to where we were when COVID started. Now, what would be interesting is on the right-hand side, when we look at private equity and M&A activity, um, on the top right, um, you will see that despite um, the COVID pandemic in Q1 2020, we've seen um, best performance of a, a best quarter over the last five years, um, both in terms of the number of deals and um, the quantity uh, as in the, the ZAR amount of, of performance. And obviously, those were transactions that came in prior to um, COVID-19. So there has still been activity on deals being closed um, in the market, both acquisitions, um, disposals, um, and there have been some JVs. What is not included on this page, which I want to touch on, is when you look at capital raises um, in South Africa and on the JSE, we've seen about a billion, um, I mean, sorry, a billion dollars of capital raise, when you compare that to the rest of the markets globally, that, that is uh, really insignificant. Um, when you look at the UK on the public markets, on the equity side, the capital raises have been over $13 billion. And this is obviously slightly also a reflection of where we were. Let's not forget where, how as South Africa we came into um, COVID pandemic. We were already seeing a recession. We were already seeing re-ratings of our credit um, as well. So um, that is a reflection of that. Now going into the next slide, um, let's look at a little bit on what uh, have corporates and private equity firms been doing. Um, on the corporate side, there has been two trends. The first one is restructuring of balance sheets. So we've seen a lot of um, capital raises. Um, secondly, disposals uh, or plans of, of disposals of non-core assets, and lastly, making sure that um, companies have cash um, and there is sufficient liquidity because we don't know how long um, COVID-19 will take. And you know, as we've seen, some of the uh, blue chip listed companies really drew down on existing facilities to make sure that they have that cash available to them and it's not sitting with the banks. And then the second trend has been around operations. Here we've seen you know, right sizing. I think we've all seen it right sizing and retrenchments by, uh, of workforces, as well as cost cutting exercises. Uh, moving on to the private equity world, um, the first step that private equity, and I think Lorenzo touched on this, uh, where do you see the balance between new assets, um, so going to hunt, 
uh, versus harvesting what's at home. So most of private equity firms and um, certainly ourselves at Moshe Capital as an investment holding company, the first step that we took was um, look at portfolio companies, ensure that our portfolio companies are operating well. And, and talking to Savka, I mean, we, I've, I've seen a lot of our, our peers as well, um, private equity firms and investment holding companies spending a lot of time. Um, in the beginning, it was in some instances daily, in some instances weekly, um, and it revolved around three trends. The first one was um, looking at strategies. Um, how are we doing? Is there things we can pivot into? Secondly, how's our liquidity? And um, I, I mean, most companies, I think, went into this looking at a six-month liquidity, but you quickly realized that the plans should be um, a, a 12 to 18 month uh, no, solely because we do not know how, how long the pandemic will take and the recovery is going to be much longer than uh, uh, initially anticipated. And then another trend is also obviously disposal of non-core non assets and securing um, equity capital partners. But another thing or that, uh, another trend that we've seen in private equity firms is firms going back to their LPs to raise further capital. One um, for follow-ons into equity of um, existing portfolio companies. And secondly, for bolt-on acquisitions. Uh, we will see a lot of bolt-on acquisitions. So companies that are great can actually get um, lower valued assets, but quality assets that only lack the liquidity. So if you have cash to acquire, this could be a, a great time to do that. And I think Lorenzo also spoke about that. And then the other thing uh, which has been surprising, I guess, from my end is, um, is around capital raises by GPs themselves. So there have been new funds that have been raised. Um, so as an example, Capital Works uh, raised 5 billion from uh, Morgan Stanley and Passion Square um, Capital Management in the US is planning a $4 billion um, capital raise, uh, even in these markets. And I guess also, um, you know, things around ESG impact investment, um, and with what has happened in the US around George Floyd and, and all of us realizing that we, we need to have a voice as minorities, there's also investments into that minority space. So there's a lot of capital raise that is um, assigned to supporting minority businesses, especially around SMEs, which is what is needed at this point in time. At the bottom of this page, we speak to what are the things that the themes that we're seeing as people are doing M&A and uh, private equity deals? I mean, the first thing is that uh, deal lead times are much longer um, or everyone that is investing is taking their time to do thorough due diligences. Um, there's a lot of investment uh, committee decisions that are made where investors and, and investment committees are more um, uh, risk averse and uh, also ensuring that for each and every risk identified, there is um, uh, mitigating factors. Um, but we're also seeing themes around ensuring that contracts are resilient, um, ensuring that um, checking if there's su the support from government, um, are your IT systems working as well as, as, as they should? Can you work remotely? Um, but most importantly, and I think this applies both to um, GPs and to investee companies is the power of management teams. Not um, in this time, it has been extremely critical to have the best management teams. And I think, you know, as the GPs and, and investors, we always look at management teams, but this time has actually shown um, that management teams are critical. One, um, the teams that have acted calmly uh, and put strategies in place, as well as acted fast, are the ones that, that have managed to keep their companies steady. Um, there's also a lot of MAC clauses, so material adverse changes clauses that are being put in place uh, to make sure that one can actually come out of a transaction if need be. Um, and then the fourth point that I wanted to make is around valuations. Um, valuations have been quite difficult because we all don't know what the future is going to bring and history is not going to necessarily reflect the future. So there are a lot of valuation gaps between sellers and buyers. And this can be mitigated and um, innovation is also needed here. So we've seen a lot of clawbacks, a lot of um, in-out structures uh, where um, 
management teams and um, sellers are, are paid depending on what the performance will be in the future. And we've also seen a lot of share um, considerations instead of pure um, cash considerations. There are also a lot of warranties and indemnities that uh, are being put in place. Um, and obviously, some of those came from uh, the COVID-19 effect. Now, going into the last page, which is where it gets meaty and why we're all here, um, which is where are the opportunities? Um, it currently is a, is a buyer's market. So companies that have strong balance sheets and cash right now have an opportunity um, to do acquisitions of strong assets uh, with great uh, profitability that might be lacking on balance sheet, on strong balance sheets um, as well as cash. So we're seeing a lot of corporates looking for companies that uh, can bring synergies or vertical integration. Um, from corporates, we're also seeing uh, blue chip companies disposing of non-core assets, which bring opportunities, um, especially for private equity in investors. On the private equity side, we are seeing increased private equity acquisitions. Um, as Lorenzo mentioned, um, uh, when you look at 2008, 2009, the companies that were, or the private equity players that were able to acquire companies quickly, but with innovation of structuring, um, came out with the best returns. So as private equity players, when, when you have a capital right now, um, it is a good time to acquire uh, to realize great returns. We're also seeing a lot of SMEs looking for equity partners. What has been different uh, between, I guess, this timing and, and, and other times around uh, SMEs looking for partners is that SMEs are not only looking for um, cash. They are actually looking for active investors. They want investors that can actually contribute to their strategies, that can contribute to um, their capital structurings, as well as innovation on where to pivot their businesses to. There's a lot of um, delisting opportunities that we've seen as well. Um, certainly at Moshe Capital, the first thing that we did as the markets were, were crashing is look at um, the stock markets. Um, and we've looked at companies below 5 billion rents and said, which of these companies um, are good targets and have great underlying uh, operations, but are now either cash trapped or um, need uh, to be taken off the stock markets because it's an expensive exercise to be on the stock market, as we all know. So if, you, if you're looking for opportunities uh, below that 5 billion mark, please feel free to touch base with us. We, we've we've um, put together a list of certain companies that we believe um, could be great targets. Um, I've spoken to the disposal of non-core assets by, um, by majors, uh, which, which, is, um, which is also coming through. Um, as an example, I mean, Telcom um, has mentioned that they want to dispose of their um, towers businesses and the land costs, which are about 12 billion rents worth. Um, so we'll see a lot of that, all of those trends. And we've seen a lot of um, blue chip listed companies coming to us to, to request help on that, on, on the disposal of their assets. Another trend that we've seen is around um, the type of funding. Um, typically, uh, we've, we, we know only the, the, you know, plain vanilla debt or equity markets. But we're seeing a lot of hybrid structures. Um, in fact, a lot of also alternative investment funds that are being raised in the market. So um, we're seeing quasi-equity um, instruments such as mezzanines and convertible uh, debt uh, instruments. But it, it, it's time for innovation, but into structures that actually work for the sellers as well as uh, the investors. So we're seeing a lot of alternative investments coming into the market. Another trend which Lorenzo mentioned is around foreign direct investment. I, I think this is going to be another big trend. So for uh, companies looking to sell uh, the, some of their businesses, um, there will be, a, a, an, and the delistings, uh, there will be a trend where um, foreign uh, companies are coming into South Africa. And we saw the same around 2008, 2009. And obviously this is because the, the assets are, have lower valuations but also um, we've seen the rent devalue um, extensively. So with the rent devaluation, assets are coming in quite cheap. Um, when we come to sectors, Lorenzo has already uh, touched on some of the sectors that we've seen as well. Um, tech is, is 
top of mind for everyone, online, everything. We're all using Zoom, Microsoft Teams, some people house party after hours. Um, but um, tech and online uh, is, is becoming quite key. And um, I certainly have used, as, as an example from a South African point of view, Zulzi, which was an app that you know, previously was well, did not take on quite quickly, but in these times has actually seen uh, great performance. Not only that, but they've also partnered with uh, Checkers to do the 60 minutes delivery, which I think most of uh, us have been using. Um, so there is a lot of innovation in South Africa around tech. So we'll be seeing online healthcare, online schooling, uh, online financial services. Um, I do not see a lot of us still going back to the point of drawing cash. There are so many alternatives that are coming out in the market. Another trend that we've seen at Moshe Capital um, is around uh, healthcare and life sciences. Uh, there is a lot of um, um, requests on companies that are around healthcare um, and more importantly around organic foods. Um, our partners, VSA Capital, uh, as an example, through that we've seen a lot of um, requests from China uh, on um, agricultural uh, businesses. So be it primary agri, but more, more, more so we've seen a lot on the secondary um, agri. And I think, I mean, lastly, this is time for innovation. Um, the deals are out there to be done. There's still great businesses out there that um, require capital. So the cash is king right now. Um, if you have cash, you can actually get great assets at very, very uh, um, good uh, valuations. Um, and lastly, um, the one thing that I had not mentioned was around distressed assets. There's a lot of distressed M&A that we've seen. So, I mean, just to sum it up, um, the M&A and uh, private equity space has not been as bad as we perceive from outside. It is terrible, but uh, it's not as bad as we've seen from outside. The markets on the JSE have kind of recovered. Um, of course, the economy is doing badly, but we see opportunities for activity on private equity and on m and uh, where there is consolidations, as well as taking, opportun taking opportunities of lower valuations. But what we need to do is ensure that from a structuring point of view, uh, there are certain innovation that is brought in um, to curb the risks. And lastly, using hybrid uh, instruments uh, is also critical. Thank you. Excellent. Can you hear me? Please. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm struggling today with my with my microphone. Thanks, my major. Thanks a lot. I think we need to to do a few. We, we will need to be succinct in the in the Q and A, which is a little bit against uh, uh, my nature and, and probably also my major's. So we'll we'll we'll, do, we'll try our best. Uh, but maybe let me read out a couple of questions and then we throw it uh, to to myself and my major. The, the one question from Rogan, what do you think uh, private equity firms will be looking for in post-COVID era uh, if the revenue growth is not a given uh, uh, in the medium term? So uh, let me maybe make a quick comment and then I'll, I'll pass it on to you, uh, Mecha. I mean, I think to be honest, uh, it's in, this, in this phase, it's going to be either, it's, it's really one of the two, the two options. So either you have you're betting on buying uh, much lower than the intrinsic value in which case you're happy to take uh, the the hit for a couple of years on revenue so long as you believe uh, that the long-term revenue is not materially affected in the particular sector where you are where you are where you're about to 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 buy uh, and that's that's the one the one big theme and the other one is obviously you do look at growth but that is in very very uh, uh, small niches that are either the digital, the, the sort of green uh, related niches, healthcare in some spaces or subspaces. Uh, so, so, so these are really the two, the two things that, that I think private equities are looking at. And of course, if you look at Europe and the US, uh, they will be looking at hopefully taking advantage of the low interest rates, uh, which, uh, which will, uh, will, will allow them to, to, to potentially 
uh, to potentially lever up deals uh, quite quite substantially, which increases the, uh, the the overall returns. So I think it's going to be a mix of these three things. What's important is to to make a judgment call on the long-term revenue hit vis-a-vis -vis short to mid-term revenue hit. They cannot, most private equities can take a short to mid-term uh, revenue hit if the company is going to be healthy long-term. The other, I mean, thanks, Glenn, I, I totally agree. Um, the other thing we've seen is, and this applied for us on our portfolio companies, but also on companies that uh, we've been looking at, is scenario planning. So there's even a paper, um, if I'm not mistaken, by Safka that speaks to this, where you need to look at different scenarios, and based on the scenarios, then you can figure out where you, you, you are comfortable investing. So, um, and in those scenario planning, you'll look at obviously different revenue cases uh, in, in the next uh, you know, three to five years. Uh, but I found that that is uh, extremely helpful in, in analyzing what, is, what could be the lay of the land uh, in the company that we're entering into or what we are acquiring. Yeah, there's a question from Russell. Uh, do we think that the South African economy can be opened up faster now, given the low COVID fatality rate in comparison to the fast looming economic crisis with risks of social unrest as a, re as, as a result thereof? Well, I mean, th th this is, of course, the, the, the $1 million, $1 billion question, really. Um, th th my personal view is that there's very little option uh, uh, on the table to not reopen. Uh, so the opening needs to happen. Obviously, how the opening uh, happens is the key to making sure that, that the fatality stays low, hopefully lower than it is today. I mean, let's say the rate is fine, but the, the numbers in absolute terms obviously is, is, is not, uh, uh, is problematic in this phase. So I think that the, it's, it's an end end situation. We have to reopen and we have to ensure social distancing as much as we possibly can. And we have to expand capacity in the healthcare system as much as we possibly can. Unfortunately, there's really no, that I see, there's really no silver bullet. Every country had their own theory. At the end of the day, this has been very much, I think, the, 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 the general learning and you see the mistakes of certain countries playing out. So, so, so the problem has been not so much the theory, but more the execution. Mecha, do you have a perspective on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, Lo, and I mean, uh, from a South African point of view, uh, we, need, we need to open, but cautiously, and the numbers in the last weeks have been, I mean, certainly for me, I, I think they've been a bit troubling, and the next three weeks, as we're getting to the peak, will inform um, what is next. Uh, it, the, the numbers have, however, been increasing um, at a much faster rate, but the, our economy does need to be opened up with caution um, on, on which sectors and how and why. There's a question on, um, from Fabian. Uh, for investments focused into distressed businesses, how can we play a more active, proactive role? Are the banks or other institutions sharing openly uh, I mean, typically, yes, in the sense that, you know, typically it's, it's in the interest of the banks to make sure that, that the deals happen so they, they do share uh, rather openly to qualify the uh, uh, investors. Of course, Cobra itself, uh, and I hear, I mean, Gary, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but Cobra itself uh, gets, by virtue of, of its, the role that is, that is playing, uh, we are getting uh, quite a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, we are allowing and being able to do quite a lot of connecting uh, 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 potentially interested investors into companies that are struggling. So Cobra itself, I think, can be a, 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 a definitely, a definitely, definitely an avenue for um, if you need investing, um, then then come to Cobra and through Cobra we can put in, put you in touch with Lorenzo and Mosh and uh, Mamecha. So I think yeah, definitely uh, come to Cobra. Uh, I think we put put the website address up www.cobra.org.za, and then we can then help you to get in touch with with Lorenzo and Omecha. Yep, 
Uh, we found the same in our network. Uh, we do have, we do see a lot of uh, distressed assets, alignment to business rescue practitioners, alignment to um, developmental finance institutions. Um, but yeah, I think it's best to to go through COBRA and uh, you'll be put in touch with, uh, with us for opportunities. Perfect. Lorenzo, should you take some a few more questions? Yeah, do we believe deals will use less debt going forward so businesses have stronger balance sheet in tough times? Is that somewhat forced upon PE firms as bank are more Banks are more conservative and are likely to provide more than two times the bid uh, in senior debt. If this is the case, how does PE firm get strong returns if growth looks muted and the ability to use cheap debt will be reduced? Yeah, I think this is a question for, it's a very good question from, from, from Keval. Uh, I hope I pronounced it uh, right. Um, so, of course, on the one end, you have low interest rate. On the other hand, what you'll typically see possibly is a bit of a credit crunch in which banks are more cautious, private equities themselves are more cautious because they have more uncertainty on the EBITDA. So certainly, uh, um, certainly, the, I mean, what you're stating here is, is, is certainly true for a phase in the crisis. Now, we all hope that this phase will be slow, it will be small, it will be short, but that depends very much on the perspective, uh, on the perspective I had. But I do foresee a phase in which what you write here and what I just repeated uh, will happen and, and, and is probably happening already. The other thing I would add is, uh, I think I spoke to it uh, during the presentation is around uh, hybrid um, instruments. Uh, so hybrid instruments will be key at this point in time and those would be helpful um, in terms of bridging between the, you know, as a typical plain vanilla debt and uh, where the equity, where the private equity companies will come in. Um, the trick is to get the balance between buying quite low, um, in, in injecting enough of the senior debt and finding the right uh, hybrid structure such as the mez, uh, mezzanine, um, which of course will realize closer returns to yourselves, but actually they, they um, they come in handy in terms of taking up that the the differential in on on um, on the required capital. Excellent. Maybe one last one. Uh, we uh, this is from Rukesh, MD Construction, uh, have seen a significant increase in demand for funding partners for infrastructure projects. Uh, are private equity and venture capital companies keen to explore funding these projects with a construction company like us? I mean, what I can certainly say, well, first of all, I'm very happy to, 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 to sort of uh, 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 connect you with, uh, with uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of parties that might be, uh, might be interested, but also I think that the more the infrastructure has, let's say, a, a, a degree of a hard asset with a long-term, let's say, uh, uh, cash flow, foreseeable cash flow, uh, and and ideally low risk uh, in, in construction phase. I think the more you fall into the defensive type of investment space, which should be uh, more prevalent rather than not in this in the in the coming phase. So I would say these kinds of stuff will be if they have these two characteristics will be very palatable. Yep, um, we've also seen. I mean, I don't know what. Uh, the the sec I mean what what part of uh, infrastructure the person who asks uh, is playing in but when it comes to renewable energy we are seeing a surge on requests for renewable energy play um, from private equity players from corporates um, from international so FD foreign direct investment from international partners looking for that defensive um, uh, portfolio. Um, and there are quite a number of like uh, infrastructure funds that are actively looking uh, at, at transactions and a few that have been closed in the last three to six months. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Gary, I think we, we thank you a lot. I'll leave it to you to close the conversation. I'll, uh, in the meantime, I just, thanks, uh, I just thank uh, 
Amitra, of course, for, for joining and Cobra as usual for, for hosting us. You are always great, uh, great hosts and for everybody from, for joining us today. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amitra, and thank you, Lorenzo. Lorenzo from Singular and, uh, and Amitra from Moshe Capital. If you have any other questions with regard to um, mergers and acquisitions, you want to get hold of Mametra and Lorenzo, please go to cobra.org.za, get, get the details, or send an email to info at cobra.org.za. Coming up next week, as you can see on the slides, Catherine Young uh, is the founder of Think Room. She'll be on Cobra to discuss selling during COVID-19. We've also got our long race from Race Corp. He's uh, a business incubator expert. He'll come onto the show on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Pepe Marais um, is in the advertising space. Those that have an interest in advertising, please join us. But please join us for all these webinars. They are free. Uh, Cobra offers free advice also to you if you uh, a company that requires financial assistance during this pandemic. Please come to Cobra. We offer a whole range of advice uh, from consulting, turnaround advice, financial turnaround advice, legal advice, um, all types of advice. Uh, it's all pro bono, so please join us um, and uh, get, get involved and we'll assist you. Until next week from the COBRA team, it's goodbye.